I've been on a quest to find a few 1U servers that will replace my 2 and 3U servers. These servers will have to be powerful enough to drive all of my virtual machines that run all my workloads. And at the same time, it needs to give me a little more redundancy than I have now. My current servers use a total of 5U, and if I can pull this off, I can regain some precious rack space. So I think I might have found the perfect 1U server, and hopefully by the end of this video I'll have 1U over 2. So dumb. That's so dumb. Before we get started, a huge thank you to, well, all of you. And thank you for the likes and comments ahead of time because it really helps the algorithm. But a sincere thank you for helping to make this channel what it is today. And a huge thank you for joining my live stream. If you'd like to check that out, I stream every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday on Twitch. I spend a lot of time answering a lot of your questions. So if you have a question about any of my videos, I'd love for you to join. So thank you again and let's get into it. So let's talk about my 1U servers. Over the last year, I've been making great use of a couple of my servers, but my virtualization workhorse has been my Dell R710. This server, along with another one, drive a lot of my tutorials and a lot of services that you see in my videos, and some that you don't see. And while this server has worked great, I felt like I needed something a little more modern, a little more efficient, and get some redundancy at the same time. And over the last few weeks, I've been trying to create a more robust solution than just one big server. And at the same time, I've been trying to consolidate some space on my rack. This led me down the path of trying to find the perfect 1U server. I even asked for your help on a live stream. In those streams, we talked about some of the different solutions, some of the possibilities, and even some of the challenges that we'd face with a 1U server. This led into conversations about DDR3 versus DDR4, onboard GPU versus discrete GPU, onboard IPMI, multiple servers versus one big powerful server, a custom build server versus a bare bones server, SSD versus mechanical SATA versus SAS drives, fan speed and noise, and even the dreaded AMD versus Intel conversation. Now this was a fantastic experience. It allowed me to lean into you and the collective knowledge of the whole entire community so that I could tap into a full stack of knowledge. So I sincerely appreciate your engagement and your feedback. And so I've had a lot of deciding to do over the last couple of weeks. While I could get a bigger rack, I'd like to make better use of the rack that I have. So I set out to build a 1U server. And so what did I end up settling on? I ended up picking up a super micro super server 5018R-M barebone server. This is a 1U rack mountable system that has an LGA 2011 V3 socket. It only has one socket, but we'll get into that later. It supports many different Intel Xeon E5 2600 processors, either the V3 or V4, but you'll see my choice later. It has the Intel C612 chipset, and it has four three and a half inch hot swappable bays, and it supports up to one terabyte of ECC DDR4 2400 megahertz RAM, and it has eight slots to fill. It has six USB ports, and it comes with a 350 watt power supply. And there are also a few other extras that I didn't expect. But enough talking about the specs, let's open it up and take a look. So what's in the box? Upon opening the box, the first thing that I saw it came with was rails. This was a huge plus. This just saved me 50 to $60 from buying rack rails that are only half as useful. So super happy about that. So we have lots of additional parts. And here's the passive CPU cooler. And then there's the server, of course. And this is what they call a barebone server, but it's actually pretty full featured. So after opening the server up, the first thing you see is this fan shroud. Now this thing's kind of flimsy, but it is what it is. It helps force the air over the CPU cooler. I guess as long as it keeps the CPU cool, I'm cool with that. So now let's install the CPU. And what CPU did I go with? I went with the Intel Xeon E5 2680 V4. This thing is pretty sweet. It has 14 cores and 28 threads. It's clocked at 2.4 gigahertz, but can turbo up to 3.3, and it has 35 megs of cache. And I've been thinking about underclocking the CPU a little bit, but we'll see if my workloads can handle it. And I also think that this CPU supports GVT-G, where I can pass through the GPU to multiple virtual machines, which could make for very interesting virtual machines or even Plex transcoding, but more on that later. So next up was my RAM choice. I ended up going with the Samsung 32 gig DIMMs. Now these DIMMs are DDR4. They're registered, so ECC. They're clocked at 2400 megahertz. And I chose 32 gig DIMMs. 
So I picked up a total of 256 gigs, but you'll see why I only installed 128 gigs here. So after installing the RAM, next up was installing hard drives. So the first drive might be a little unexpected. I chose for the OS drive a SATA DOM. That's because I didn't go with the traditional SSD for my OS drive, nor did I go with the typical USB drive. I ended up choosing a Supermicro SATA DOM for the OS drive. These SATA DOMs are pretty awesome, and it was my first time using or seeing one in person. But this SATA DOM is a small SATA 3 flash memory module. It's more reliable and faster than USB, and this one doesn't require external power. And you can tell which ports to plug this into because they're yellow. And it did come with a power adapter, just in case. But this will run the operating system for my server. And ultimately, I decided to go with this because it saves some space, it's fast, it's reliable, it uses less power than an SSD, and I really didn't have the space to install an SSD within the chassis. And these drives can read up to 520 megabytes per second and write at 95 megabytes per second. Now it's not going to win any performance tests, but I thought it was a good choice for my servers. Next up is the cooling system within the server, or just the fans. Now it did come with four operational fans, and the two on the left are just dummy fans, which did kind of throw me off. And these fans, when they start up, are pretty loud, like most servers. But after the system posts, it's actually surprisingly quiet. So the next thing you'll probably notice is a PCI Express slot. So here's one of the downsides of having a 1U server. I only get one functioning PCI Express slot, and I have to use it with this riser. The way that this works is that this riser ends up blocking all of the other PCI Express slots due to the height of the 1U server. And so this riser prevents other devices being plugged in using traditional methods. And while I'd love to have two PCI Express slots, I didn't want to have to have another 2U server. And maybe there's a creative way I can figure out to use another one in the future. So let's take a look at the back and here's the I.O. ports. So we have a single power supply, a serial connection I'll probably never use. We have IPMI on the back here, which is fantastic. We have lots of USB ports, 2.0 and 3.0. And we have dual gigabit NICs back here, which opens up some interesting possibilities for NIC teaming or bonding. And we have a VGA port, which is nice, but I'll be using IPMI after the initial setup. And here you can see the one lonely PCI Express slot. Next, we're going to install all of my drives. So we have four hot swappable drive bays, all with quick release. They feel pretty cheap, but they get the job done. And it comes with these dummy drives that you'll have to take out. And I decided to fill these with four one terabyte Samsung Evo SSD drives, which are pretty cheap right now. I went with consumer grade because they're a lot cheaper. I get a five year warranty and I'm comfortable with the redundancy that will be built into my RAID, which will be coming soon. And after installing these, I ran into my first challenge. I bought and installed the wrong trays for this SSD. After installing the drives and lining them up, they didn't align with the backplane, which totally makes sense, but I wasn't thinking about that when I was buying my adapters. So I ended up finding these three and a half to two and a half drive bay converters, which worked out nicely. It positions the connectors in the same spot they would be on a typical drive. And they're made of metal rather than plastic, so they won't soak up heat. And so after doing that, my SSDs aligned with the backplane. Oh, and don't forget to put the stickers on and take note of your serial number. Once I had all four drives in their converters and then in their sleds, I could slide them right in. Oh, and totally random, I picked up an additional CPU because I heard that some of the boards don't come pre-flashed with V4 support. So this is a 2620 V3. It's super cheap and really nice. I figured for less than 20 bucks, it was a nice insurance policy just in case I needed to flash the boards for V4 support. Plus it gives me an excuse to build another server. Maybe. No. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. So back to the fans in the PCI Express device. I ended up picking up a few more fans, albeit heavier duty ones due to my mistake when ordering, but they worked out just nicely. Replacing the dummy fans was super easy. I just swapped out the rubber feet and put them in place. That's when I realized I didn't have enough fan pins. There's only one available fan pin towards the front of the chassis. There's another one up by the CPU, but I didn't have extensions on hand. And I decided I'm not going to use it. So I zip tied them down and we were ready to go. 
Then I decided to install my PCI Express device. I went with the NVIDIA Quadro P2200. I went with this device for some stream encoding, batch conversion of videos, and even some flex transcoding. This is a true one use slot with two. This was important to me since I didn't have much room. After trying to install it, I realized that the SATA DOM was in the way. Luckily, they provide two SATA powered ports. And it was a tight fit, but I got it working. And this was another reason why I got more fans, because I wanted to push out all the hot air and keep the components in this area cool. And after messing with this for about 10 minutes, I finally got that satisfying pop when it snapped into place. Then I powered it up to make sure it was all working, and now it's good to go. Now let's close it all up and it's time to fire it up. And the first boot worked without a hitch. It recognized the CPU, recognized all of the RAM and was operating in safe temperatures. I burned in and tested the memory ahead of time because those issues are hard to track down later. Oh yeah, and in case you couldn't tell by all the hints, I ended up buying two. I'll have two One U servers to add some redundancy to some of my services. This will allow me to run a Proxmox cluster and possibly some HA with Kubernetes, which is a lot more robust than what I have now. And so, with these two servers in hand, let's go install these servers. This time I decided to change the RGB lighting for this upgrade. And as everyone knows, green RGB gives you better energy efficiency and purple RGB gives you less errors. I thought this was fitting since I'm gonna decommission some of my older, less efficient servers. And also, I'm using ECC registered RAM, so hopefully that will give me less errors. So here's where I'm gonna put these new servers, right below my networking equipment. And as you can see, I don't have much space left, so I'm trying to make the best of it. And here are the two servers that I plan on decommissioning. The one on top is the one that I call Photon. This is my secondary Proxmox server that only runs one workload right now. It's running a 24-7 stream encode for one of my Twitch channels. And this will be repurposed in a future video. The one on the bottom is the one that I call Galaxy. This has been my primary workhorse for all of my virtualization, as well as my Kubernetes workloads. It's also running TrueNAS virtualized and is attached to my disk array below. So now, there's only one thing left to do, and it's install these servers. First up was installing the Rails. Now it's been a while since I've installed Rails, and the last true Rails I installed were toolless, but these worked out great. Again, super happy that these were included with the server. I thought for sure I was going to have to buy some other hardware. And after getting the rails in, all I had to do was line up the new server and slide it in. Oh, I forgot to peel off the protection. Installing the second one was just as easy as the first. You just put together the rails, install the rails on each side, and screw them in. I ran out of cage nuts during this install, so I ended up ordering some more. So when I install my new device above these two, I'll have to remember to install these cage nuts too. Hopefully. Then I just slid in the next one, and it went perfect. The next peel didn't peel so well. Oh well. And I forgot to put the drive labels on the second one, so I put those on. 
Note to self, write down all the serial numbers before you put these servers into use. And now all I had to do was plug these in. I thought this was going to be the easy part, but I didn't have enough ports on my UPS. And the plugs are way up in the front. So I ended up unplugging the second power supply on my disk shelf and my R710 temporarily. And next up was installing the network cables. I ended up getting some more CAT6 cables and running them to my patch panel and binding them up with the rest of the cables. I needed two cables for each server, one for the primary network card and one for the IPMI NIC. I may actually end up using the second NIC for some teaming or bonding, but I'm running out of ports really fast. Once plugging that in, you can see the IPMI lights turning on, so that's a good sign. And now let's fire up these servers. You can see right away that the NIC1 light turns on. And then shortly after that, you can see the SATA DOM hard drive activity flashes, and then all eight SSD activity lights flash. That's pretty awesome. And so what's next up for these servers? I dropped some hints, but in case you didn't catch them, these are going to be my new virtualization servers to drive everything that my previous two were running. Also, I'd like to cluster these two servers so that I can move things around a little bit more easier than I can now. And I have some plans for the old servers, so be sure you're subscribed to see what's next. And so that's what I've been working on the last couple of weeks. Two big server builds. And so what do you think of my server builds? Do you think I made good choices? Do you think one new form factor is worth the trade-offs? Do you have any one use servers? If so, let me know in the comments section below. And if you have more questions, comments, or concern, you can absolutely ask them in my live stream, which is every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. I'd love for you to join. And again, thank you so much for helping to make this channel what it is today. Couldn't have done it without you. And as always, stream on, my friends. Corby, oh my gosh. I think you guys are gonna crash my bot too. I love it. Hopefully my bot hangs in there. Uh, his, his, that code is uh, mediocre at best. We'll see. <laughs> Dude, P. Diddy, 10 gifted sub. Oh my gosh. <laughs> man, I can't even say hello. Man, how's it going? <laughs> Um, man, dude, thank you so much, dude. P Diddy, really, man, Gorfi too. You guys really don't have to, but I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, jeez.